Okay. Uh, once again, this is a man who's really reinvented Indian media over the last few years, and we're lucky to have him here. Um, our next speaker is in your living room. He's in the face of the Prime Minister, in the face of business leaders, sportsmen, celebrities. You can love him, you can hate him, we cannot ignore him. So today, this nation, Singapore wants to know, who is he? Arnab the man. Are we getting the video? Okay, I think uh, let's let's just go. We don't need the video because we know who the man is, so we just go with the man. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, I always tell myself I won't get shocked anymore with the things I hear nowadays. But Uday Shankar has shocked me. So there are many things, uh, many people have said many things about me. Where are you there? But no one's told me that I'm a source of comfort. <laughs> Uday Shankar says you watch the news for comfort. Uday, brilliant. We'll have another conversation on that later. The other thing that shocked me is the time limit. I see a clock here, you can't see it. It says 20 minutes. I've already expended 15 seconds. 20 minutes, Suresh and Arvind, is the length of my average question. But I'll try. I'll try. See, no one gave me a hope in hell when I left Delhi, Latyan's Delhi, and came to Mumbai to start a news channel. They said, who needs another news channel? There are too many news channels in this country. So about a couple of years before that, I wanted to quit journalism, but I was completely frustrated with the way journalism was being done in India, principally the way that journalism was being done from New Delhi. I developed a distaste for many things in the way journalism was being done in New Delhi. So I simply wanted to flee the national capital because I felt a lot of things were going wrong in this business. I got an opportunity and the only thing that I wanted to do when I got an opportunity to start this channel was, you know, when we started this channel in 2006. Have you seen Dark Knight, the film? In that the Joker, played by Heath Ledger, says that introduce a little anarchy, upset the established order, and everything becomes chaos. And he said, I am an agent of chaos. And you know the thing about chaos, it's fair. This country needed to be fair. What we did in our own style, which people like or dislike, agree or disagree, question, but you cannot ignore, is upset the existing system in Indian journalism. Now, we needed that disruption. We needed to change the way in which things were happening because of five principal reasons. One, journalism was not confrontational. It had become submissive, submissive, somewhere content with the status quo. Journalism was content with being quote unquote neutral. So you wanted to be dispassionate in the name of balance and not take a position on issues around you. Journalism had become like the gazetteer of India was in the 18th century, merely a source of information, not ensuring any social impact. Journalism was also significantly detached from people's issues, the day-to-day -day challenges that millions of Indians face. I can tell you Latians Delhi was not caring about it. But most importantly, 
journalism missed the strong element of activism and dissent that significantly today drives the profession. And I see that activism and dissent everywhere. And we see ourselves as force multipliers for that activism and dissent. So let me give you a, let me ask you a couple of questions. We had a journalism of 2010 and we, 2000, let's say 2000 and a journalism of 2015. If I take away a few things from what we reported here at Times Now, would we be a better country or would we be a worse country? Would we be a better country or would we be a worse country had we not uncovered 2G, CWG, Devas, ISRO, Aircel, Maxis, Cargill for profit? If we'd not asked those questions about those camps in the period between June 2010 and January 2011, would we be a better country or a worse country? Would we be a better country or a worse country if we had not made a big deal about the Muzaffar Nagar riots? Would we be a better country or a worse country if for one month non-stop we had not asked questions about a person who is a fugitive in London called Lalit Modi and his dealings with the Indian establishment? Would we be a better country or a worse country if we had not questioned why celebrating a grand festival graced by Bollywood's biggest stars in sci-fi in Uttar Pradesh at a time when Muzaffar Nagar riot victims were dying in the bitter cold two years back, would we be a better country or a worse country? Would we be a better country or a worse country if with absolute neutrality, we had not questioned why women are not allowed inside the Haji Ali shrine? Would we be a better country or a worse country if we had not asked why women are not allowed into the sanctum sanctorum of the Shani Shignapur shrine? These questions I put to you today. So many people ask us, well, it's a good thing that you're doing. But why do you do it this way? Is there not a different way of doing things? Why don't you speak normally? It's a legitimate question. You can speak normally. You can be nice and polite, preface questions. But then, you know, all these stories that I narrated to you, ladies and gentlemen, have been reported for decades. It's not the first time that we've done it at times now. But they've been reported in page 11 single column of a newspaper. If I was the editor of a newspaper today, I would put it as a eight or possibly 12 column headline in the front page, followed by wallpaper coverage in every page. But that doesn't happen in our media industry because we don't want to say things assertively. When we say things assertively, we know that we are going to upset some people. And there are a lot of people in Delhi who don't have the courage or the guts to say things assertively. And because they can't say things assertively, they say that we shout. When I end my 20 minutes today, I will tell you why I shout. And this is the first time I'm saying it. My first point to you is from a story in Uttar Pradesh in Lakhimpur Kheri from a place called Banda, all of you heard about Nirbhaya, but you did not hear about Banda. In Banda in Uttar Pradesh, a 16-year-old girl was raped by the ruling party MLA. He was from the Bahujan Samaj party. The girl had the gumption to go to a police station to complain against the MLA. The police station SHO called the MLA's brother and put the girl in lockup. When they put the girl in lockup, the girl was lying in lockup for a week. So to, she was all kinds of charges of theft and other charges were put against her. And the story somewhere died down. Around the winter, one year before, about the winter of 2011 or 2012, the story got reported. And after Times Now picked it up, 30 to 40 OB vans landed in Banda. And eventually, out of incredible media pressure, the MLA who had raped this girl, who had gone absconding, was caught. The story doesn't end there. The girl who came out felt so empowered as a 16-year-old that she formed her own group, which is called the Nagin Group. And they dress in black, and they go from village to village, liberating young women who are subjects of sexual exploitation in the way that this girl had faced. I say today to you, and I'm asking you here in Singapore, if you don't shout about these stories, is anyone in our country going to listen? The simple answer is they won't. So I'm told later, 
There's a movie made called Peeply Life, which trivializes my profession. My profession is not about going to a village and reporting on a piece of dirt, as was unfortunately shown in that film. My profession is a serious profession. We are agents of social change, at least we believe so. So we believe that the domino effect of what we are doing today will be felt one generation from now. So my son's generation and the generation after that will feel the impact of what we are doing today. But why is it not happening? Because of an overestimated commodity called neutrality. People say, Arnab, the problem with your journalism, as opposed to our journalism, is that we are neutral and you are not. Well, I'm not neutral. I don't believe in that form of neutrality. I don't believe in neutrality because neutrality becomes a weakness when it perpetuates the status quo. Neutrality is a weakness because it has no impact. And journalism is an exercise in futility in the absence of impact. If an, in an obvious choice between right and wrong, black and white, when facts stare you in the face, as was in the case of Banda, I'm asking you, I could not be neutral in the case of that 16-year-old girl. Would you be neutral? You wouldn't. So we cannot expect the profession of journalism to be neutral. This is one of the five disruptions we brought in our profession. Because my point is this, it is because we shouted and we cried out loud, because we were determined to ensure there was an impact that the BSP MLA who raped a young girl and then booked her for theft in 2011 was arrested and brought to book himself. The second disruption we brought is distance from the establishment. Because someone once said that journalism can never be silent. That is its greatest virtue and that is its greatest fault. Journalism must speak and speak immediately while the echoes of wonder, while the claims of triumph, and while the signs of horror are still in the air. I attended a press conference once, and many things shocked me. I mentioned two at the start. The third thing which shocked me is that in 2011, Manmohan Singh decided to have a press conference. Now, there we were. Remarkable, I mean, uh, people say everything is breaking news. I mean, nobody would complain if he would say breaking news, but more Singh to talk. Not in 2011. But we went there for this press conference and there were 15 or 16 edi editors, eminent editors in a room and the Prime Minister of India walked in. They all nodded gravely at each other, all parts of the establishment, knowing glances, little whispers on the side. We are all part of the cozy club. I was editor number 13. For some reason, I had my own private security guards around me because this was immediately after we broke the fourth scam, which was the Devas Isro scam. Now, when 12 eminent editors of the country ask questions before you, you believe they will ask some question about the scam. Because any of you in June 2011, face to face with the prime minister, would ask only one question, sir, why are there so many scams breaking out? There was not one question on the scam. Everything else. One editor said, you know, this is what I believe on macroeconomic policy, et cetera, et cetera. You know, and the Prime Minister noted, good advice, good advice. And then editor number 11 even asked, sir, what is your message for Sachin Tendulkar with a cheeky knowing smile at the Prime Minister? The Prime Minister was zapped because Sachin had scored a century or something a day earlier. But is this the kind of question you ask? So when I asked my Prime Minister a question, and the question was on the Devas Isro deal, the Prime Minister's press secretary, Harish Kare, jumped in almost and said, look here, this is not news, this is not an inquisition, you cannot have an inquisition, he's the Prime Minister of India, etc., etc." And my question was simply about the layering that had been done in the Devas Isro deal, whereby the approving authority, the sanctioning authority at four levels were the same, right up to the Space Commission and the Prime Minister's office and the private company. The Prime Minister realized and he pulled out a piece of paper below him and he answered my question. Moral of the story, is simply this. The media in this country has stopped asking relevant questions a long time back. And it does not ask the relevant question even today. It wants to be on the right side of the establishment. For what reason, I don't know. We brought in that disruption. We built a distance from the establishment. We challenged everyone, including the Prime Minister. We have questioned every dispensation. And unlike some people who, after having served in the government, write a tell-all book 15 days before Manmohan Singh is to retire, and you know who I'm speaking about, we questioned Manmohan Singh when he was one year into power, and we questioned the present government with Lalitgate 11 months after the Narendra Modi government had been sworn in. 
The third disruption that we brought in was of deciding what is the order of news. I've never fathomed what is the order of news. When I started my career, we, uh, my news editor was a wonderful gentleman called Appan Menon. And Appan Menon once called me and he said, Arnab, there is a story to report. I said, what story? And he said, outside Tagore International School in Delhi, I think, there's an open manhole and a child has fallen. And I said, Appan, I'm sorry, I'm not going to report this story. And Appan said, why? I said, because Appan, you know, I'm qualified. I've studied these subjects. I've got these degrees. I want to cover politics, Ministry of External Affairs, Finance. Give me anything. Not a story about a child falling into a bore well. But when Times Now launched, and I did not do the story, and when Times Now launched in 2006, four months after launch, someone called me and said, when they were reading the daily order of the news list, my news editor said, well, this is the story. And there's one story, but it's a Hindi channel story. And I said, what's the Hindi channel story? They said, your five-year-old child called Prince has fallen into a board well. And I said, where was this? He said, this happened in Kurukshetra in Haryana. When a five-year-old child had fallen into a board well, an open board well that was supposed to be covered by the government. For some reason, because I haven't been able to distinguish English and non-English, English and Hindi, elite, non-elite, journalism built it into those compartments. For some reason, maybe out of a sense of genuine remorse, maybe to come to terms with myself for not having reported what Appan told me 10 years back, I reported and reported like crazy the story of Prince. Till today, people say, Arnab, that's the most sensational story you've done. My colleagues tell me I ruined journalism with the kind of coverage I did on Prince. For three days, we only reported on that child. I can tell you when we opened the phone lines, the whole of country will, was calling and people were suggesting ways in which the child could have been brought out. Some people were suggesting ways in which engineers were calling on how a parallel pipe could be built without hurting the child. When a slight movement was there in the child on those cameras, the whole country almost heaved an upside and then went down again. And sitting in the newsroom of Times Now, away from the badgering of my profession, the badgering of Latian's Delhi journalism, which tells you this is sensational film. Sitting in a mill shed in Lower Parel, I could feel the heartbeat of people in this country. And I could feel my own mistake 10 years back when I was part of Latian's Delhi media. And I, I don't know what right or wrong I have done in my profession. But when Prince came out, and when this uh, Jawan from the uh, sappers, engineers of the Indian Army, picked the child up and covered up, and took him out, the whole newsroom was just standing and watching. My newsroom is Young India. Uday says very rightly, he invests in young talent. My newsroom is 21, 22. My news editor is 27. All standing and watching. And when the officials came out and said that Prince was alive after the four-day ordeal, people were crying in my newsroom. Because somewhere, we have a pent-up anger at the injustice in our system. You are all from the IIM, from an institution of privilege, and you are in positions of power. But somewhere in your collective memory, there will be that moment when you have experienced the deep chasm that exists in our society. Prince was the story of that chasm. And somewhere our bringing it out was just a vocalization of that, a catharsis. That's not sensationalism. It's the order of news. It's where we underestimate the impact of our profession where we know that we can have impact, now we don't do it. Someone asked a relevant question, do you do it for TRPs? I want to be a hypocrite and say I don't look at the viewership figures, but I don't do it only for the viewership figures. We do it for a lot more than the viewership figures. We do it because there is a sense of justice that we need to have. And trust me, we find no pleasure in taking it all on ourselves, and we do take it on the chin. When you break the Commonwealth Games scam and Lalith Gate and take on people in positions of power, let me tell you, we're not cherry-picking stories for our own advantage. We are doing stories because we believe in it from the heart. And I have made mistakes in deciding the order of news, so I'll just tell you the fourth thing, and I don't know they've stopped the clock because they've given up on me. You see, we've done things. We've questioned hypocrisy. I'm going past a few points. We've done interviews. We've done interviews which are not cozy chats. Sometimes I wonder why people give me an interview. Uh, 
Sanjay Dutt was being released. Now, he finally got released, but for the last six years, he's been in and out and in and out and in and out. I never understood our obsession with Sanjay Dutt. He's not even at the top. But Sanjay Dutt, every time he came out of jail, there would be this Indian paparazzi behind him, including us. So I'll end with one story which has changed my perspective of my role and my commitment. I'm an army officer's son. That's why I started that way. When Sanjay Dutt got released, there were other stories happening. I didn't bother about them. So Sanjay Dutt got released, and everybody chasing him like a madman on the Pune Expressway from Arthur Road Jail. He's going to another jail in Pune, including our camera. And cameramen are short of putting drones behind him. We did everything. There were cameramen doing acrobatics on bikes, taking shots and calling the desk, kya shot mila. And those kind of bizarre conversations were going on. And someone said, we have exclusive mila. I said, kya exclusive mila? Bola, Sanjay Dutt ka exclusive mila. What, what did he say? He said, I have full faith in the Indian judiciary. It's a fantastic. What an original comment. So we were doing sundry things like that, and the afternoon was passing, and I came in, and over lunch, I received a phone call from a gentleman who says, I am a lawyer, and I'm from Bangalore, or Nob, and I have followed your career for the last 10, 15 years. And I just called to say today that after today, I will never watch a news channel in my life. And certainly not you, or Nob, because you let me down. I said, what happened? He said, my best friend, Colonel Vasant Venugopal of the nine Maratha Light Infantry. He martyred himself in hand-to-hand -hand combat in Ghode Tal, 15 kilometers north of Uri town. Now, Colonel Vasant Venugopal, I found out, was 42 years old. He had a young family, his wife, and two children. And he was going to take premature retirement, I think, and so he had a whole life ahead of him. And I'll just read out, and he, anyway, I'll, before I read out, I'll tell you what he said. He said, I'll never, I'll never follow you because when his body was brought to Bangalore and the senior most officer brought to Bangalore, not one channel was covering this. Not one. And I said, I'm an army officer's son, so it hit me so hard. Not one channel covered him, and including you. And he put the phone down. So I, again, had the same feeling that I had about not covering Prince. And I said to my news editor that day, I said, we'll do Sanjay Dutt later. I'll start the news hour today by talking about the martyrdom of Colonel Vasant Venugopal. And I'll read up something about him. I'm reading a small news report. Troops of nine Maratha light infantry spotted a group of heavily armed infiltrators 15 kilometers north of Uri town. The terrorists, on being detected, failed to escape towards the Pakistani line of the LOC. Colonel V. Ven Venugopal, commanding officer of the nine Maratha light infantry with reinforcement, rushed to the site. Under the determined and resolute leadership of Colonel Vasan, troops in a deft mood flushed out all the terrorists, displaying cool courage and operational acumen. He led from the front and led his party, despite being wounded, with little care for his personal safety, leading from the front, gunned down the entrapped militants, and in the final point-blank face-to-face exchange, he succumbed to injuries in hospital. Now, this incident was completely unreported. I decided to lead that day with a tribute. I got the pictures from Doordarshan. We did a tribute. And I actually called this gentleman his friend as my first guest on News Hour. And I was about to start my discussion. The story was playing. And I, my producer told me that your guest is ready. I said, she, uh, he is ready. He said, no, she is ready. I said, she, but uh, you know, the gentleman was, uh, you know, who called me was so-and-so. He said, no, Arnab, there's been a change. about." Half an hour back, Colonel Vasan's wife has decided to come on your program. And I had nothing to say. What do you ask someone who has just cremated her husband four hours back? Why has she come on my program? What does she want to say? I was silenced like never before in my life. And for the 12 to 15 minutes that Subhasini Vasan spoke to me, she changed my entire impression of what this profession is all about. And though she spoke from the heart, she spoke without flinching. She didn't display or wear her emotion on her sleeve. And she spoke about how sh proud she were, was that her children were in the, were a martyr's children. Changed my entire perspective of this business. I narrated this only to tell you a simple thing. I have 10 examples I'm stopping with four. That please believe somewhere that we believe. 
please believe that some of us in the media in India want to change our country. That we are resolute optimists despite facing the Rajas, the Kalmadis, and the Lalit Modis, despite making professional mistakes of the kind that we have made in our profession. We believe that if there is one influence which is keeping this country under check, if there is one reason there is no riot after Muzaffar Nagar that grows bigger than that, and that akhlaq did not spread into a riot and a cauldron of hate, it is the media. So I came today to seek your support. And I wish and I hope and I believe that I have your support when I go back for what we are trying to do in our own country. Our form may not be correct. Our questions may be long. Our tone may be too confrontational sometimes, but our heart is absolutely pure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Arnab. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we're supposed to end at three, but with your permission, I'm going to cut into the tea break for about seven or eight minutes. I think we have the opportunity to actually have a great dialogue with Arnab. So there are so many questions that have come that I'm going to take that liberty, please. Arnab, thank you. I think everyone saw a different side of you. Uh, I'm going to start with the more personal questions. There are questions on the news and the media, and you address some of that. And I'm actually going to start with a very, very personal question. Do you have any friends? <laughs> I have a few. <laughs> I do have a few, yeah. College and, friends mostly. Yeah. And there's a concomitant question with that. Is the Arnab that we see on television, the, the stories and the causes that you fight, is it the same person? Is there a different Arnab? Arnab unplugged, is he a different person? And I'm not constantly in that mode. <laughs> you know, I gave an interview recently where I said I can debate in my sleep. It was made a headline. Someone took it seriously. No, I, uh, you see, yeah, I guess it's the same, yeah. When you go to a dinner, tea, you know, to a cocktail, you're not doing this. Yeah, if you want me to, I will. <laughs> if, uh, do you want a live exhibition tonight? We, we're going to yeah, try. Yeah. So you, <laughs> people take him up on this challenge on this one. No, no, see, I have, I, the, for several reasons, uh, some to do with my own sense of uh, learning who I am and my own strength because I was never a good student. I was never good at anything. The only good I was, thing I was good at was arguing and debating from class six. And so I no, felt... Let me stop you there. Let me stop you there. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> so, and later in college, debating was a way to, you know, earn money. Every time you earned a debate in Delhi University, you would get 500 rupees, so you know it would sustain us through college. So, it's something we enjoy. And you see, I don't like these convivial discussions with five people sitting around. And oh, but we all agree the environment must be improved. Oh, we all agree terrorism is bad. I mean, what's the point of this form of agreement if it's all going to be consensual? You'll never get any strong views. So I, you know, this debate format is not fake. It's actually what this country requires. So. One of the questions is, despite the grilling that the people, you put people through, what inspires, <laughs> inspires them to come on your show when they know they're going to get beaten up? It's a very good question. But I think they enjoy it. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I think they like getting provoked with the right question. I mean, some people have given me interviews later and gone on to regret it, but then they've given me the interview, and I've never wondered, I've always tried to ask myself, why did the person give me an interview? I mean, I went hammer and tongs after N. Srinivasan in the IPL1 scam, and he ended up giving me the interview. And then during the interview, he tried to walk out twice. And then I called him, and I said, sir, is everything okay with you? Because first of all, I busted your case. I went after your son-in-law. You've called me for an interview. You're walking out twice, but you're coming back. So why are you coming back, Mr. Srinivasan? And, you know, we never came to a conclusion on why he was coming back. But, you know, I think he wanted a sense of finality on the episode. But whatever. I, it's interesting. So there's a couple of other questions, you know, and I think they're all talking about do we need to be aggressive? And I think to some extent you have answered that in your thing, that unlike, unless you shout, you can't get anywhere in India. But um, there's also a couple of... Um, I'm just going to, there are so many questions out here that I'm trying to find the right ones to ask you. You can let, if you just want me to keep talking, I can. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. Um, but there's but this an interesting one about the conflict of interest between, you know, news channels and the bias in reporting. And, you know, the Times of India itself famously talks about the fact that, you know, uh, that, it's, that it's, it's a business first. And, you know, journalism is a business first. 
So what's your take on that as a news person? No, journalism is a business in the sense that you have to pay the salaries of your journalists. So obviously you have to be, you know, running business. I mean, that's okay. But, but there is no compromise in my, I, I can't talk about no, others. You really no, cover there is, there is, favor. There is, there is no compromise in my journalism. The day I compromise a little bit, I will quit this profession. I am not in this profession for adulation, making money or signing autographs. I'm doing it because I believe in it and I don't think anyone would have and, the courage to tell me what to do. Ar Arnav, let me. I'm too polite. I have to say, let me, right? I can't be him, <laughs> but let me. Um, do you do you really? I mean, if you're if the owner of the Times called you and said you cannot carry the story, it hasn't been done yet. So. And you're saying that it, your profession is more important. I will. I will always be true, hundred percent to my profession, only to my profession. And and there is. I'm telling you this. Suresh, I'm, I mean it, Suresh. Why do people, I mean, at the end of the day, people are advertising on our channel. Why are they? Because we are being watched, right? Not because we are doing things for a motivated party. I don't believe in editorial sellouts, so let's be very direct. Don't be nuanced with me. Ask me whether I've sold myself out. I've not sold myself out. Given my track record, I'm unlikely to. And, and I think that we can do great things for the Indian media without selling out, because I think that's a cop-out. If you do that, you shouldn't have entered the profession in the first place. Thank you. And I'm... Like I said, I think many people have seen a very different side of you and, and what motivates you. Um, there's an interesting question out here. How did you feel after Rahul Gandhi's interview? I felt, I felt good. <laughs> and I was asked also by them that, well, how do you think it went? And I said, I think it went well. <laughs> it went well for me. <laughs> and. I, I guess that is also the answer to the question, which has been the easiest interview and the one you have most enjoyed. <laughs> yeah, it's all what? Different. Uh, one last thing, Arnab. Uh, when you go back and you say that you know, you've done this stuff, can you just give us a moment when you went back home a night after you did an interview, after you did a story, and you said, tonight I felt I was true to my profession? I had Lalit Gate for me for three weeks before I broke the story. And People told us that you went hard after the Congress government, but you will never be able to take on any BJP guys. I mean, that's essentially the sh long and short of it. I had the Lalit Gate story for me three weeks. And for three weeks, I was trying to get a confirmation, 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 Suresh, because, you know, essentially, if you do a story like that in which you're going after the foreign minister and a couple of people, that if the story ends up being factually incorrect to a little bit also, so, you know, you'd, you'll end up in a difficult spot. So. I don't know what happened, but I called my office at about 11.30 on Saturday night, and I said that wh what is the quickest you can get to the PCR? I don't know what happened. I said, when is the quickest you can get to the production control room? So we fathomed that everybody was having a late Saturday night. They said, boss, by 9 o'clock we'll be up on a Sunday. I said, okay, 9 o'clock we will break the story. At 12.30 I gave the lines. At 2 o'clock we gave the story for edit. The story was edited by about 6 o'clock. And I just drove into office and I broke the story. The, the apprehension does not happen at night. The apprehension happens between the time you fire a story like that and the reaction. Because what if the whole world comes and tells you that you are wrong? Because let me tell you, my, sometimes my biggest critics are people in my own profession themselves. Every time I've done a story that is good and impactful, my own people in my profession have wanted to prove me wrong. Like when I broke Commonwealth Game Scam, the country's top editors went to Suresh Kalmadi and told him, Isko abhi chodo mat. I know that kind of advice was given, which is why he threatened to file a lawsuit against us. Now the fact is, at 9 o'clock we broke the story about 9.10. At 9.25, we got a confirmation from guess who? From Sushma Swaraj. Because she put out a statement accepting it. She said, she tried to justify it, but in essence, she accepted the basic substance of the transaction between her and Lalit Modi. And at 9.25, I said, wow, this is the best day in my life because I've got a confirmation from the person who I'm questioning. So there are those moments of apprehension and self-doubt. But you know, if you do your stories well and you, if you do them with some modicum of you know, research, you don't often get it wrong. I mean, I, I'm, I've been okay, I've been lucky so far. Thank you. I think, uh, Arnab, there's one question that I think I'm just going to summarize out here. Have you destroyed the concept of debate, of discussion, of listening? Are you being judge, jury, media, executioner, lawyer? 
Yeah, you see, that's a valid argument if you question the how things were being done before. But as I told you, that I'm bored watching these channels where two people sit down and say nice things to each other. I mean, that's pointless. We pick up a story of topical interest. We do it for a purpose. You see, there is a sense of finality about it. See, when we go after a story, we go after a story. We did, the flyover tragedy happened. And those of you who are from Kolkata, I'm sure there are a lot of people. Everybody knows there is one thing called the syndicate in Kolkata. You can't build anything in Kolkata unless you give a subcontract to somebody related to the ruling party. Nobody touched the story. Everybody went there. The top anchors, editors all went there. How are you feeling? How are you feeling? Nice, nice, bad, bad. Take the flight back. Nobody did the story on the syndicate. We caught the mayor of Bidhanagar on tape saying, I am the leader of the syndicate. I have 20,000 people under me. It was on a spy cam. It is unfortunate we had to do a sting operation on him, but we put the sting operation out because the story needed to be told. So you know what? Uh, this consensual, nice story approach doesn't really help anyone. So yeah. Thank you very Thank much, you. Arnab. We're going to have Arnab Uday and the next speaker also on a panel for about 20 minutes. Yeah. Thank uh, you. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very Demand. much. Thank Arnab. you. Thank